Hi, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. So now we are in Chapter 2, Atomic Structure. And now we're going to focus on the subtopic of 2.1, Bohr's Atomic Model, Part 4 of the video. So in this video, we're going to focus on the calculation of the ionization energy for the hydrogen atom in the Lyman series. Also, we're going to state the weaknesses of the Bohr's Atomic Model. And last but not least, we need to be able to state the dual nature of the electron using the D property postulates as well as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. For the D property postulate and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it can be quite complex for you to understand that. But at least for your level, which is in matriculation, you just need to be able to state the dual nature of this principle. And as long as you can do that, then you are fine. For the learning outcome of H, I and J, we're going to look about that in part 4 of the video, which is in this video. Meanwhile, for the learning outcome of G, we have looked about that in part 3, which is in the previous video. So, without any further ado, let us start with part 4 of the video first. So, ionization energy. So, ionization energy is basically a minimum energy that is required to remove one mole of electron from one mole of gaseous atom or ion. So let's say if you have a gaseous atom here, so this gaseous atom here will absorb energy and this absorption of energy will allow the electron to be removed or donated and hence this causes the gaseous atom to be converted into gaseous ion. For our level, which is at the Bohr's atomic model, we're going to focus on the hydrogen atom as the hydrogen atom allows the system to be in one electron system. Okay, so let's say if we have our hydrogen atom here, which is Hg, so when the hydrogen atom here absorb energy, it will be able to remove one mole of electron, and this causes the hydrogen atom to be converted into hydrogen gaseous ion. And this process here is known as absorption of energy, or known as the endothermic reaction. So, for the ionization energy, for the ionization of electron to occur, the electron need to be removed from its ground state, which is at n equal to 1, and this electron going to be excited to n equal to infinity. And at n equal to infinity, the potential energy of the electron will become zero. Hence, we can say that the nucleus attractive forces has no effect on the electron, and hence we can say that the electron is now free from the nucleus forces of attraction, and the electron can leave the atom in order to form the ions. So to understand more about that, let us look into the differences between excitation and emission as well as the ionization energy. So for, for excitation, it basically means that the electron is being excited from a lower energy level to a higher energy level, for example, n equal to 3. So from n equal to 1 to n equal to 3, it is an excitation processes. Meanwhile, for emission, uh, when the electron is being excited, it is very, very unstable. So the electron can fall down to n equal to 2 or even to n equal to 1. So this process here is known as emission. It means that the electron is still having a force of attraction to the nucleus. However, in the ionization energy, when the electron absorbs very, very high amount of energy, the electron becomes super, super excited that it goes up straight to the highest energy level, which is at n equal to infinity. So when the, when the electron is at n equal to infinity, it is very, very far away from the nucleus. So when it is very, very far away from the nucleus, the attractive forces between them does not exist. So the electrons are happy to leave the, the system and hence, as a result, the electron is going to be removed and the ions are going to be formed. To understand more about this, let us look into the example. So for example, number one, we need to calculate the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom from n equal to 1 to n equal to infinity. And we need to determine 
the ionization energy for one electron, which is in joule, and for one mole of electron in kilojoule per mole. So, in order to answer this question, we need to be able to visualize this situation. So, as mentioned, the electron will absorb so much energy that the electron will gonna be excited to the highest energy level, which is at n equal to infinity, where it does not have any attraction towards the nucleus anymore. So, in order to find the ionization energy, we need to know the initial state, which is n equal to 1, and the final state, which is n equal to infinity. So, we can use the formula of energy, which is delta E equal to RH 1 over ni square minus 1 over nf square. And remember that for the energy equation, our RH value here is going to be used as 2.18 times 10 to the power of negative 18. And this needs to be in the unit of joules. And our initial here is 1. And our final state there is going to be at infinity. Initial to the final. And as a result of that, 1 divided by infinity, you're going to get 0. So lastly, you're going to get the energy for 1 electron. Electron going to be 2.18 times 10 to the power of negative 18 joule. So we have done it for one electron, but how about for one mole of electron? So for the ionization energy for one mole of electron, you basically need to multiply the energy that you have calculated with an Avogadro numbers here. So the Avogadro number here refers to 6.03, 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. Per mole and when joule multiply by per mole and once we do the maths here you're going to get 1.312 times 10 to the power of 6 joule per mole but now the question asks us to calculate that in kilojoule per mole so what we're going to do here is that we're going to bring 10 over 6 10 to the power of 6 here to become 10 to the power of 3 so it's going to be 1312 times 10 to the power of Three joule per mole and tens power of three we can convert that into kilojoule per mole and this is how you find the ionization energy for the hydrogen atom in the Lyman series because it refers to n equal to one here now we can also find the ionization energy via experiment because in experiment what you're going to get here is the line spectrum here which is the hydrogen line spectrum and as what you know that, L1 here is going to be your first line in the Lyman series. And then here is going to be the second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, sixth line, and so on. Until here, it, re it reaches the infinity. So when it reaches the infinity, we can say that it has reached the convergence limit. So the convergence limit here is basically the wavelength or the frequency at which the spectral line merged together. Dah terlalu rapat that it almost macam seolah-olah bercantuman. Because the difference between energy level becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, the gap here becomes smaller, 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 and even smaller here. And for the ionization energy, we can determine that by identifying the wavelength of the convergent point, which is at this point. So if we know the wavelength here or the wave number at this point, we can find the ionization energy. So let us look into the example. Okay, so for the example here, um, we have our line spectrum and we are given the wave number times 10 to the power of 6 per meter. And the Lyman series, and this refers to a Lyman series of the hydrogen spectrum. And as usual, we need to calculate the ionization energy in kilojoule per mole from this spectrum here. So, in order for us to do that, we need to find, uh, we need to note that the wave number here refers to 1 over lambda. So, you need to be very careful because wave number is not equal to lambda. It basically equal to 1 over lambda. And for this reason, you can use delta E is equal to HC over lambda. And you can further expand that by saying that HC is multiplied by 
1 over lambda, where 1 over lambda here refers to a wave number. Okay? And from here, you need to be able to determine which of the following is the convergent points. So the gap here is the largest, right? So you know that this is the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, and the last one here going to be your convergence limit. Okay? And for that reason, we're going to use the width number given as here. So our H here refers to a Planck constant, which is 6.6256 times 10 to the power of negative 34 joule per second. And our C here is the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. And 1 over lambda here refers to 10 times 10 times 10.97. And do not forget to multiply it by 10 to the power of 6. Okay? And it carries a unit of m minus 1. Okay? And once you do the maths here, you're going to get 2.18 times 10 to the power of negative 18 joule. And the equation here needs to be in, a, in the unit of kilojoule per mole. So what you need to do is you need to multiply that with an Avogadro number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 per mole. And for this reason, once you calculate, uh, the digit here, you'll get 1.312 times 10 to the power of 6 joule per mole. And then the similar thing as before, you need to convert that into 10 to the power of 3 joule per mole. And then 10 to the power of 3 here refers to kilo joule per mole. So lastly, you're going to get 1312 kilo joule per mole. And for here, you can cancel out the unit just to be sure that you can get the joules here. All right. Next, we're going to look into the weaknesses of the Bohr's atomic model that has been proposed by the Niels Bohr. So before this, I've mentioned that the Bohr's atomic model is only applicable for one electron system. For example, hydrogen. And because of this, the theory that proposed by Niels Bohr will not be extended in order to predict the energy level and the spectra of atoms and ions that contain more than of one electron, as this theory is restricted only to hydrogen spectrum or ions that contain one electron, for example, helium plus or the lithium two plus species. Also, uh, Niels Bohr said that the electrons are restricted to move in a certain distance around the nucleus of an atom, which is not quite true when you are dealing with a quantum, a modern quantum mechanical model. And the theory of Niels Bohr is unable to explain the formation of the extra lines in the hydrogen spectrum. So there, are, there has been quite limitation to what the Niels Bohr has said. And because of this, some of the concept of Bohr's of the Bohr's which is the discrete energy state, has been endorsed by the modern quantum chemistry. So the modern quantum chemistry um, believe in the idea of energy level, which is lower energy level, let's say n equal to 1, higher energy level, n equal to 3 or 7 or something. So they believe in the idea of energy level. However, modern quantum chemistry totally reject the circular orbit that the Niels Bohr introduced. So, uh, the Niels Bohr has stated that the electron move circling around the nucleus. But this is basically untrue, and there has been quite a number of scientists that against the idea of the Niels Bohr. And this brings us to the idea of the three Broglie postulate, where in 1924, the Louis de Broglie proposed that not only light, but all matter which all matter here include electron, has a dual nature, are the dual properties in which they have wave and corpuscular or the particle like properties. So the electron have a wave particle properties. And for this reason, the D property deduced that the particle and wave properties of an electron are related by the expression here. 
where lambda is equal to h over mb, where lambda here refers to a wavelength, and h here refers to a Planck constant, m here refers to the mass in kilogram, and v is equal to velocity. However, you just need to be able to state it because there's no going to be any calculation that is required at your stage. Okay, and this equation here basically allow us to calculate the wavelength of an electron or a particle with a mass and moving at a certain velocity. Okay, and for this reason of the dual nature, the idea of Niels Bohr has been totally rejected. And this is supported by another scientist, which is Heisenberg. So Heisenberg has shown that it is impossible for us to know simultaneously both the momentum and position of a particle, such as an electron. And he stated that delta x delta p is supposed to be equal or greater than h over 4 pi, where delta x here refers to uncertainty in measuring the position, and delta p here refers to the uncertainty in measuring the momentum, where the momentum is basically equal to mv. So when there is a change in momentum, there's going to be a change in the mass or the change in the velocity as well. And the hydrogen and the h here refers to a Planck constant. And as before, you just need to be able to state the principle and there will be no calculation required. And for this reason, we're going to use the concept of de Broglie v and Heisenberg uncertainty principle in order to reject the Bohr's atomic theory. So, based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, if the object has the mass of an electron, which is very, very small, then the x and p here, which is the position of the electron, and the momentum of the electron will become significant, which is important. Because when the mass is really, really small, we find it difficult to exactly determine its velocity and position. So because of that, we can never describe of how electron move in an atom. So this idea has been rejected because it's, it's not necessarily moving in a circular orbit. And when we apply this uncertainty principle to the hydrogen atom, we can see that in reality, the electron does not orbit the nucleus in a well-defined path, like what we think it is. So we cannot point where it is or how it moves exactly because of these properties as I mentioned here. And what we can do is only to calculate the probability of finding an electron kebarangkalian untuk kita berjumpa dengan elektron tersebut in a certain position at a certain time. And this region of space in which there is a high probability of finding an electron in an atom is known as the orbital. So for the new model, new quantum mechanical model, they reject the idea of Niels Bohr, but we believe in the idea of orbital. So in this case, we have 1s orbital and also 2px orbital, where this orbital here is the concept that we're going to learn in the subtopic of 2.2, which is in the next video. All right. So I think that's all for today's video. See you again some other time. Bye.